we wait for, for the others, uh, well, let's say we don't wait for the others and uh, get slowly started. Um, last week in sort of our introductory session, we were starting by looking at nutrient cycles. So we were painting the big picture. Um, what pools are there for nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, etc.? cetera? Um, what pool transformations are there? Which fluxes in an agroecosystem are, are there? And uh, um, now recognizing that at that point, we, we weren't really familiar with all these boxes. We didn't really know exactly how large they were, what was in these boxes. We weren't really familiar what these arrows were, are. Uh, this week we will dive more into the uh, aspect of uh, what is in these little boxes and then over the next week we'll learn about the arrows. Um, to wrap the uh, issue of nutrient cycles up, um, I want to look at a couple of case studies and uh, where we need this knowledge about nutrient cycles, uh, where we need to know where are nutrients flowing in an agroecosystem. Uh, here. Uh, two very contrasting agroecosystem in New York dairy farm uh, and a Kenya smallholder farm. Uh, first, um, New York dairy farm probably cold, Kenya smallholder farm probably warm. But you see already uh, there are other differences here. Um, 50 to 1,500 cows per farm in this uh, report by Stu Klausner from our department. Um, and uh, in Kenya, smallholder farms probably rarely exceeding 20 cows per farm. Hamel Helen, would you say that's an adequate uh, representation? Are there many farms in, in Kenya or Joseph who exceed? Hmm? So a large farm would be seven. Yeah, yeah. So 20 is, is really on the upper side. It's probably a large scale commercial already. Um, Lord Delamere uh, farm probably has, has many more than that. But but let's, let's live with that for the, for the moment. Um, I don't have input here, but uh, this was very well reported <coughs> and documented in the uh, New York dairy farms um, from relatively low nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium inputs into the farm um, to quite high amounts of uh, annual inputs. Uh, by the way, this MG here, that's not magnesium, that's not a misprint for milligram. Uh, I'll try to use SI units as much as possible, so I refrain from any acres, inches, or, or any of that. Um, so we try to use metric systems, so these are megagrams or tons. Uh, <clears throat> and um, so let's look at, at uh, these two, um, uh, some, some case studies here, a New York dairy farm with 500 cows and a Kenya smallholder farm with probably only a few cows. Uh, input with fertilizer, in the New York system, about 22 percent, 66 percent of the nitrogen uh, comes in by feed and a little bit, about 12 percent by nitrogen fixation. On the Kenya side, relatively similar actually, the proportion of, uh, of input where, where the nitrogen comes from. Very, very similar uh, distribution. So also here, the largest proportion being the feed um, of nitrogen input. Output with milk, uh, in the New York farm, about 22%, animals itself about 2%, crop 0% because this is a strict dairy farm. Um, in the Kenya smallholder system, there are a little bit mixtures. There are also crops that are being uh, an output. Um, but also there, the, the budget is very, very similar. So remaining in the... Um, in the ecosystem are about uh, 70 to 80 percent of the input of nitrogen. So now the question is, where does it go? So we're putting 100 percent in, 70 percent go out with products. Where are the remaining 70, 80 percent? Any suggestions? What, what all could happen now that we know all about the nitrogen cycle? Tara, denitrification? Yeah, so that's, um, can, you, can you give a, a compound that would be lost by denitrification? N2O, N2O and O, N2, something like that, yeah. Um, other, other fluxes, yeah, Peter? N fixation. N fixation, so it's retained in the soil. Um, what, what is fixed? I, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping the, the, the lessons here. What, what exactly is fixed uh, for nitrogen in clays? The ammonium, correct, yeah. So we'll, we'll look at that next week or after next week. 
um, that's the ammonium. That's not the nitrate. This thing's fixed. Other other ideas. Where where would the nitrogen remain, Joseph? Leaching. So it's exported, but it's not exported as a product. Uh, it's exported by leaching, lost by leaching. Yeah. Other ideas? Yeah. Volatilization of? Um, well, probably through manure application of, of ammonia. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, to, to N2 gas. Um, Tara mentioned denitrification, N2, but volatilization, ammonia is a, is a very um, uh, famous, infamous uh, uh, product to put on and lose um, ammonia, uh, NH3, a gas. Um, at high pH, ammonium, NH4 plus, is transformed at, uh, to, to ammonia and can uh, exit the soil. We'll look at that later, but that, that's also a possibility. So we have gaseous losses, we have leaching losses, we have nitrogen remaining in the, in the soil. Um, so we, we find probably, if we dig further, we find more of this. So this probably will explain our 72%. Let's, um, let's see uh, what in this Kenyan system um, in, or here's a budget for Sub-Saharan Africa, even by Stofogel et al, um, colleagues from, uh, from the Netherlands. So they made a, an N balance and uh, looked at the inputs, mineral fertilizer, animal manure, uh, deposition, biological nitrogen fixation, and sedimentation. Um, and you see that uh, also, accor according to their assessment here, uh, the fertilizer made up a large proportion uh, together with um, biological nitrogen fixation. Uh, these two bars are, by the way, are two estimates for different uh, time periods. And the outputs are a large portion is a, a harvest out, uh, output, uh, crop residues, uh, a smaller leaching, much less actually than harvest products, and you can argue about that. I mean, this is a large-scale assessment uh, done with a lot of assumptions, with a lot of transfer function use, uh, so, you can, so you can argue about that. Gaseous losses make up uh, about double, almost double what, what leaching losses make up. You can also argue how do you actually measure N2 uh, denitrification, N2 losses. Um, and erosion is a, is a large loss as well. So to their assessment, actually, um, the, if you think about the, the values that we just heard about, that the 76%, most of the nitrogen is probably lost and not retained in the system. You see here that the total losses depicted by these two bars here for these two time periods are much greater than the inputs. So not only can we explain probably the 76% that we can't find in crop harvest, um, with losses in the ecosystem, but probably we lose much more than we put in. So under these circumstances, this is probably a, a classic example for nutrient mining, that we actually not only not find our inputs there, but we lose much more than we put in. And I want to uh, sensitize you a little bit also that we're not in a pure biophysical world. There are people involved and there are uh, social structures that have a large impact on the nutrient cycles. And here you see farm nitrogen and phosphorus balance for some Ethiopian farms for categorized into rich farms, medium, poor, and very poor farms. And uh, of course, depending on what, which criteria you, you use for defining poor um, but uh, to leave that aside, we have here some data for two different regions within Ethiopia, highlands and lowlands, highlands and lowlands, lowlands on the right. Um, and you can see for nitrogen, uh, it seems that the, uh, the nitrogen balance is always negative, so we lose always more nitrogen than was put into the system. Um, but other than that, there seems to be not a very discernible uh, trend within uh, between these, these groups of um, farmers. Uh, however, for phosphorus, it seems that there is a really distinct uh, trend here that with uh, uh, increased wealth of these uh, Ethiopian farmers, you get an increasingly positive phosphorus balance. Why do you think that um, 
that the nitrogen balance is so distinctly below zero and the phosphorus balance, even with the poor ones, hovers rather around zero. Having in mind our uh, phosphorus cycles and nitrogen cycles from last week. Um, the question was, why is the phosphorus budget for all these farms either zero or above zero? Um, so it, it's accruing phosphorus, it's not losing phosphorus, even with the poor farmers, whereas nitrogen, no matter how rich you are in this particular assessment, uh, it's always negative. You, these farms always lose nitrogen. What, what just to make educated guesses, yeah. That's a possibility. So it's a, it's a phosphorus input from, um, depending on how they did this assessment, whether they considered uh, a manure input an off-farm transfer. Uh, if the cow is standing on the field, they probably won't consider that. But if the farmer takes it from another field or from another farm and puts it in, probably then that will be counted as an input and, and could lead to a, a positive balance. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. Any other suggestions? Helen? That's a good suggestion. So phosphorus doesn't have a gas phase. We have no gaseous losses of phosphorus. Um, it doesn't really leach all that much, especially in tropical uh, soils. We, we look into that. Um, don't get nervous if, if, if you didn't come up with that, uh, because we look at that specifically. But that, that's a good suggestion. We, lo we, we um, uh, touched upon that, that for phosphorus, under uh, non polluted or heavily manured systems, we usually have very low leaching, especially in the tropics. Um, and uh, so we have very little losses usually. So unless the crop uptake and offtake is really tremendous, we're probably hovering around zero. And since their yields are not that ecstatic in these areas because there are other nutrient constraints, the offtake for phosphorus is usually very low. Um, and anything that comes up, like for instance manure, or maybe they have a little bit um, money for fertilizer uh, that creates then uh, immediately a, a, a positive balance. Whereas for nitrogen, we have all these losses that we mentioned before. We have gaseous losses, N2O, N2, NH3. We have leaching losses for nitrate. Um, so the, the, uh, the budget can very, very quickly go into the negatives. Um, and these are just some images. Well, this is the time for switching this off. Um, just to see, uh, this is by the way from Western Kenya, uh, the differences in, in wealth structure here. You have uh, one farmer on the right that uh, has thatched roofs and a, a mud house without windows and is predominantly um, cropping corn. Um, whereas in the other picture behind there, you can vaguely see that has some animals, has bananas, has coffee. So the, these are adjacent farms and, and the wealth structure has a huge impact, of course, on what they crop. And that in turn has a huge impact on the nutrient cycles in, in these cropping systems. Um, now we go after finishing up this with a few case studies, um, why we are really interested in nutrient cycles. We'll, we'll delve more into the aspect of uh, what are these little boxes? What, what, what is organic nitrogen? What is inorganic nitrogen? How much is there? Um, and uh, what does it look like? So we first fill the boxes before we bother about the arrows connecting the boxes. This is a nasty table of, um, of all kinds of functions that uh, nutrients have in plants. And um, I don't want to, you to memorize that. Um, in any form, uh, there are a few aspects that I want to highlight. And, and I think you, you can already see that it is instructive that I start actually with the plants. And that brings us back to the beginning, really, where we said the starting point for nutrient management and soil fertility is really the plant. The plant is what we feed, not the soil, um, in, in, uh, in the, the goal of that. Um, but we see later that uh, to achieve that, we have to have profound knowledge about the soil. Um, so let us look at this here and, and learn about the elements that are necessary for plant growth. Um, and uh, you see that there's a whole slew of essential elements, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, calcium, magnesium. There's another page of that. Um, and you're probably all familiar with these, with these nutrients already. And you see that there are, in practically all 
compounds in plants that are important for the survival. Um, and they are essential for, for all the basic functions of the plant, photosynthesis, metabolic transfers, enzyme activity, the osmoregulation, reg uh, regulation, protein synthesis, cell division, everything. So without these nutrients, it doesn't work. Without one of these nutrients, it already doesn't work. That make it, makes it an essential nutrient. If one of them is missing, the plant can't grow. Um, and uh, uh, this goes on here with iron. So these are the micronutrients, what we call micronutrients, iron, manganese, zinc, copper, boron, molybdenum, uh, chlorine. And uh, chlorine, as I might have mentioned earlier already, chlorine is only a, a, a nutrient that only came recently on the list, I think in the, in the 40s or 50s. Um, why do you think nobody knew about chlorine before as an essential nutrient? Yeah, Peter. It's toxic in higher levels, but that applies to all of them, actually. Um, yeah, but <laughs> uh, yeah, that that's, that's, might have skewed the, the perception. Yeah? Probably because it was hard to find any instance where chlorine was lacking in the soil to actually see a nutrient deficiency in chlorine. That's, that's a good explanation. And, and why is that so? There are two sides to it. Because you mentioned that there is probably enough. The other side is? Yeah, so chlorine is very abundant, so you wouldn't realize that chlorine is messing. What is the other, the flip side of that coin from the plant's perspective? Yeah, Joseph. So you mean that, that it, it always has, the plant has very often ways of accessing uh, chlorine via atmospheric deposition and, and, and uh, 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 dry or wet deposition or, or something like that. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, but I want the plant side, um, the flip side of that. <clears throat> it needs just tiny amounts. The, the, it's absolutely almost nothing that it needs. But if it, if it doesn't have that nothing, um, it, it can grow. And it was very hard to even determine when there is nothing. Uh, because analytical facilities were not geared up to actually measure these very small amounts of chlorine in, in soil or plant, or they actually did it by, by uh, solution. Um, so that, that, is, that is an issue, uh, but that has been resolved. We know it is essential, essential and uh, um, uh, we have to care about it. But um, as you said, uh, it, it's, really, uh, it's really almost ubiquitous and, and very hard to come by a natural situation uh, where chlorine would be missing. So it's more of academic importance rather than um, of any real importance. And also with, with for instance, if you, do a, if you do a nutrient solution, a uh, Hoagland solution for your, for your salad plants or something like that, um, it's very hard to make it chlorine free. Uh, even if you don't put any chlorine in, just how it comes out of the tap or, um, or you put in other, other nutrients, potassium phosphate or so, there's always some contamination of chlorine there. So you, you essentially very rarely have that, that issue. Um, <clears throat> that information was on that slide before, but I want to highlight it um, separately, the mobility of nutrients in plants. That's something that is of great interest to us as a soil scientist as well. Um, because uh, it is on that, on that first, uh, on that first uh, two tables. Uh, so potassium and chlorine are the most mobile nutrients in plants. That means it goes with the flow, it goes wherever it is needed, uh, and it usually accumulates in young parts of the plant. And that's important when we're looking uh, later on uh, at the question whether, uh, where, where symptoms are popping up. And that leads us to uh, important clues about, um, about soil fertility. Uh, N and P are a little bit more immobile than, than potassium. Potassium is really the the, the most mobile it's, um, in, in plants. Magnesium, a little less mobile. Sulfur, um, calcium, and the, some of the micronutrients are even less mobile. Calcium is it's important for cell structure, cell walls. Um, it's accumulating in, in barks, trunks, 
So um, that, that is important um, for cell walls and therefore not very mobile in the plant. And the least mobile are boron and uh, molybdenum. So they hardly move in, in, in the plant once they are in a particular plant part. Um, these optimum curves of nutrient supply uh, are probably very familiar to you and are sort of self-explanatory, but I want to go into that briefly. Um, if we plot the nutrient concentration in the tissue um, against plant yield, we will probably always uh, realize that uh, we're starting with a very low plant yield at low nutrient supply or nutrient concentration in the tissue. And that goes up until we reach a critical range where we um, get sufficient uh, plant nutrients and the highest yield. And then at some point, uh, it becomes, the nutrient supply becomes excessive or toxic and uh, our yield drops off. Just for, um, uh, for fun here, uh, a guy named uh, Steinberg named this effect. What is this all about, this, this dotted line? Why does it hang so funky down there? Take an educated guess. Angela, what would you think? Why, why would the, or describe what it is. Describe what. Well, it's saying that um, as nutrient concentration decreases, plant yield increases. So I guess um, yeah. that would mean that like, at very low levels, the plant is growing and picking up, like using some of its nutrients, but then it gets to like, a certain point where it can't grow unless there are additions. Yeah, that's an excellent description already. Thank you. Yeah. So, so as the plant grows and, and the nutrient concentration in the tissue decreases, well, that sounds pretty weird. Um, that goes a little bit contrary to our uh, expectations. And, and you mentioned one, one issue uh, or one explanation. What, what are, think, think about it through a little bit. What, what, how, why can that happen that, that um, with increasing plant yield, all of a sudden nutrient concentration decreases? Angela, give it a second shot. Exactly. So something that we call dilution. Um, so as the plant starts to grow, it has very little nutrient concentrations. Let's say nitrogen is missing. We feed it a little bit nitrogen. It says, boof, yes, now I grow. And it grows faster than, uh, than, than it can take up that nutrient. And uh, so the, the uh, nitrogen concentration, for instance, decreases in the, in the tissue. And that's Somebody named Steinberg probably described that, and that's why we're left with his name on this chart. Um, for fun, here a picture. What is that? First, which fruit is that? An apple. This is an apple. Uh, the top half apple looks uh, good and healthy and uh, ready to eat. The bottom apple um, doesn't look that good. Uh, what happened here? Um, obviously, we are in a nutrient and soil fertility class, so I'm not bothering about fungi. Um, what, what, what is that? Um, do you think that's too much of a nutrient or too little of a nutrient? Can, can I ask like a brain? Like, they just much? Yeah, that's a good guess. It uh, looks like a burn, so maybe it is too much of something. Um, what is it too much of? The toxicity of something, you never guess it, but try one. David, try one. Uh, nitrogen. Yes, <laughs> nitrogen. Wow, I've never had anybody guess that at first. So that's nitrogen toxicity. I mean, nitrogen, I wouldn't have guessed that. I, nitrogen is, we, we never see nitrogen toxicity. We see, we see micronutrient toxicity, especially with fruit trees. Um, uh, um, we see uh, uh, all kinds of other toxicity. We can, um, there's speculation about phosphorus toxicity. There's all kinds of issues, but nitrogen is very, very hard to come by uh, nitrogen toxicity. So even a plant nutrient like nitrogen, where we always say, oh, we need more nitrogen. Nitrogen is a limiting nutrient. It's the number one limiting nutrient uh, in, in most ecosystems. 
and is the number one nutrient that is applied in agro ecosystems in terms of, of amounts worldwide. It's the number one nutrient uh, that fertilizers are produced for. Um, and, uh, and, and here we see also that we have nitrogen toxicity. So anything can happen. Everything is game. Even nitrogen can become toxic. Uh, then to make matters worse, really, um, we not only have straightforward something's low, we're missing it, we need to put it in. Something's high, we have too much of it, it's toxic, we need to get rid of it somewhere or alleviate the, the toxicity. But there are also interactions of nutrients. So it's not, not easy, all that um, stuff. So first of all, um, a very simple interaction, of course. Uh, one crucial element is missing. Um, and, and so even the, the optimal supply of fertilizer application of other nutrients don't do much. Uh, if, if I'm missing nitrogen, I can put up on as much phosphorus as I want, nothing will happen. Um, but then there are also more interesting, academically more interesting interactions um, that the high supply with one nutrient can affect the, um, the supply of another nutrient. Uh, and that can actually go both ways. It can enhance and decrease the supply of another nutrient. And that can happen principally in, in very different areas. It can happen already in the soil, that there's an interaction on the soil surface uh, of particles. Um, that can happen at the root surface, uh, at uptake, and that can happen at, uh, during transport in the plant. So we have to look at, at the multiple um, problem set here. So this is something that we will discuss in depth later in the course and have some very interesting uh, case studies for that. Um, to not overlook that there are not only nutrients in soil and that soil fertility is not only a problem of nutrient uh, supply, I'll just put this quickly up and sensitize you that there is usually considered uh, the, the lack of moisture is the first um, uh, hindrance to optimum plant growth. But if we have enough uh, moisture, then immediately uh, nutrient availability kicks in. Um, and then there's a variety of other uh, properties of, um, of the agroecosystem and your, in your cropping system that you need to take care of, um, like insects, diseases, weeds, etc., to get optimum supply. Yeah, Tara? What's meant by poor stand? Um, poor stand, I believe um, they didn't provide any explanation because there's a textbook. Um, I believe that they that they might uh, uh, mean that, that it's planted poorly, the, uh, the plant density is not uh, um, optimum, that the distance to the next crop, that it's not on the heap, but in the, in the furrow or, or something like that. Um, just the seedbed preparation and, and all that, so that the, the stand of the plant is not optimum, that you have three shoots out of one stand instead of only one, and, and these kind of things. So you have a possible production that is on the right side, but you're, you're really constrained by, by a lot of different factors. <clears throat> um, now let us look at the amount of nutrients. And this is a lot of numbers. Um, if, you're, if you're really interested <coughs> in, uh, in uh, um, becoming more familiar with, with soil fertility, nutrient cycling, uh, nutrient management, it helps to have at least a vague idea what these numbers are. So that if somebody talks to you and says, I put on 50 kilograms, that you already know is that high or is that peanuts. If somebody shows you in a scientific talk that they lost 500 kilograms of nitrogen, you need to know if that's high or low. So you need to have a little bit of a feeling for, for numbers um, as they come. Uh, and, and in the course, I try to put that into context very often. Uh, so range of typical concentrations. So this is a, a foliar or a, um, foliar nutrient concentrations uh, of plants. Uh, and we see here, uh, given in gram per kilogram, we see here uh, nitrogen is 20 to 50. That's a range for, for plants. Um, that there are plants that have less. There are plants that have more. Uh, 20 to 50. Um, 50 is on the high side. Probably only legumes that have an additional source can actually get to 50. Uh, 20 is on the lower side, but there are plenty of plant parts, especially, that can have lower uh, numbers than that. You see that phosphorus has, has, has much lower, about a, a tenfold lower amount. That, that 
very often reflects also what we put on fertilizer, how much we find in soil. So it's usually 10 to 1 somewhere in that order of magnitude. Also NP ratios of, of, uh, of plants are about 10. Um, uh, potassium, about the same range as, as, as uh, nitrogen. So that's, that's in the ballpark. Sulfur the same. Uh, calcium, depending on where you are, um, there are very calcium-rich soils that can have very high amounts, but you can have also very, very low amounts. Magnesium in the same order of magnitude, maybe a bit lower. Then the so-called micronutrients, that's why I call it micro, because they are abundant in lower quantities in the plant. Iron, manganese, zinc, sort of in the same general ballpark, but then copper, um, to a lesser extent boron, and especially molybdenum, are then, then uh, in much lower concentrations. Um, Again, this, these are only ranges, and they not only vary by where this plant is, but also which plant it is. Um, there are a few <coughs> ballpark um, rule of, uh, of thumb, which, uh, which um, crops have demands, high demands for specific nutrients. For instance, legumes have a high demand for calcium, uh, manganese, molybdenum, a bit in boron, uh, rapeseed, famous for sulfur, that's a sulfur accruer, uh, if you ever have seen one. Um, sorghum, very often iron deficiency, zonk, zinc uh, for, for corn, of course also nitrogen. Nitrogen is for all of them, but it's not specific. Um, uh, wheat, barley, often reported copper. Fruit trees, that is something to keep in mind very often. The micronutrients, iron, manganese, and zinc have a problem uh, in that the root crops are very often reported specifically for having issues with uh, nitrogen supply. So just to keep in mind, nothing really to, to um, uh, learn by heart at depth, but just to sensitize you that there are different uh, crops that have demands to different extent. So what is right for one crop is not necessarily uh, right for the other. Now one step further from just the concentration in the plant to the actual nutrient export um, by, by yield. Uh, so that's essentially multiplying the concentration times the amount that you take out of your agroecosystem. Um, and to give you here some numbers, <coughs> seems cereals somewhere in the lower hundreds or around hundred uh, can be a bit less depending on how, how good your, um, your crop grows. Joseph, what, what would be uh, nitrogen offtake in, in Kenyan farming systems? Do you have... Uh, Do you have ideas? Or it's probably, well, depending on how much it grows. If you have a one ton yield, and, uh, then, then you have probably just in the teens or, or several dozens of, of nitrogen um, export in kilograms per hectare. Um, if, you have, um, if you have high nitrogen yielding crops, then, then you can have much more than that. Um, but you see also here phosphorus. Uh, much less than nitrogen. Potassium, again, in the ballpark of nitrogen. Uh, sulfur, very often, much less, although the, um, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not transported to the same extent into re uh, regenerative parts uh, than nitrogen. Uh, and again, the micronutrients, uh, very, very tiny amounts. Um, forage can have a huge amount exported with, uh, with yield. <clears throat> you see here, five, a hundred. Uh, kilograms of per hectare uh, for nitrogen. And here this 30-year-old forest, um, a, a huge range also, but for the 30-year rotation, uh, that's not per year, but for the, for the particular yield, uh, you can have also exports that are in the hundreds. If you divide that by 30, the number becomes small as an annual export, a calculated hypothetical annual export. But um, for the 30-year rotation, uh, there is a substantial export here as well that we need to reckon with. Um, total amounts, now we move from the plants into the soil. And uh, for the first three nutrients, N, P, and K, we see very similar uh, trends as in the, in the, uh, um, uh, in the plant. So uh, potassium and nitrogen sort of in the same ballpark and phosphorus um, about an order of magnitude lower, 
course, for potassium, you can have potassium-bearing primary minerals, and then the, the amounts can go through the roof. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the plant really needs that much. Um, and uh, sulfur, uh, usually a bit lower than, than nitrogen. Um, calcium can have a very wide range. Of course, there are lime soils, so you can have very high amounts. You can have very low amounts uh, in tropical soils, similar to magnesium. Iron depends very much what soils you have. If you have a sandy soil, it's very, very low. If you have an um, uh, iron oxide um, uh, bearing horizon, uh, profile, then, then it can be very high. Um, a few numbers are, are interesting. Here, for instance, I calculated the kilograms per hectare and one meter depth. Um, and that, that is usually a, a nice number. Um, many uh, total stocks, we call that total stocks, are reported in that because it gives us, we just assume that one meter is whatever the vegetation can, can access. So we, it's not really true. Many, many crops only exploit the first 20, 30, 40 centimeters, and some crops take two meters, and trees can root up to 20, 30, 40 meters. So it's, it's really just a ballpark one meter, but for comparison, it makes very often a lot of sense. And, and it allows you, these numbers, to keep them in mind, allows you also, or to calculate you for, for your own problem set later on, um, it gives you the opportunity to also compare it with above ground uh, nitrogen or phosphorus or potassium accrual. Um, and, and usually amounts 3,000 to 5,000 uh, kilogram nitrogen per hectare and one meter depth is a low number, and 15,000 is a very high number. Um, if you compare that with above ground accrual that could be in the hundreds, um, you, you then realize that if you have only 2,000, 3,000, uh, and you have a, an annual uptake of um, an offtake of a few hundred, you're already getting into trouble very soon. Um, very instructive also to look at the comparison between above ground and below ground stocks. So these are total amounts above ground, and these are just ballpark comparisons. Um, you see here, there's quite a lot more nitrogen in below ground um, uh, in, uh, in the soil than, than phosphorus, what we just said. Potassium can go through the roof because there are, um, there are very, a lot of minerals that have uh, potassium. So in, in, if we're not situated right now on an oxysol with very poor uh, mineral supply of primary uh, minerals, then, then we have a lot. Sulfur, less than nitrogen in the ballpark. Um, the, the above ground you can't see so well, but if we look at the ratios, we, we, uh, we already estimate that we have a, a large below ground nitrogen uh, and potassium pool in comparison to above ground. So the ratio of above ground nitrogen to below ground nitrogen is probably much lower for, um, for nitrogen uh, than, for instance, for phosphorus. Um, and, and that means that, um, that we have probably, um, the, the vegetation has fewer problems accessing, uh, um, accessing uh, for instance, sulfur, um, uh, Sorry, accessing nitrogen than, for instance, sulfur, where this ratio is, uh, is skewed towards, towards the above ground biomass. So that, that's something uh, to keep in mind. This is something I wanted you to have a look at um, uh, as a preparation for today's class, uh, the nutrient forms in soil. Now that we have um, looked in, into the uh, total stocks, uh, we want to learn a little bit more uh, what forms the nutrients are in, in the soil. And here's, for instance, solution uh, concentrations. And the first number is always the uh, uh, concentration in milligram per liter. And in brackets are about the percent. And these are ranges and ballpark numbers. Um, then exchangeable, as, as much as there is for, for all these uh, nutrients. Uh, So-called fixed, and we'll, we'll um, talk about that later, what that means. But uh, obviously, the name already um, conveys the message that this is probably not uh, readily accessible, whereas the exchangeable is the accessible and the solution is the very mobile and, and immediately accessible. Mineral is what's in the mineral, and organic, obviously, is, is in the organic matter, soil organic matter. Yes, Helen. Um, when you talk about primary minerals and secondary minerals, what does that mean? Um, 
primary minerals um, are minerals that are formed through geological processes um, for phosphorus, for instance, as an appetite has a lot of phosphorus in it. That's a primary, primary, primary mineral um, for supplying phosphorus um, in, in the soil. Um, a secondary mineral, for instance, is a kaolinite, is a clay mineral that would be formed after these primary minerals that are formed by volcanic eruption, intrusion, sedimentation, what have you. Um, uh, and after those are weathered, uh, you can f have a reformation of so-called secondary minerals, and names for that are goethite, uh, kaolinite, um, the iron oxides, uh, hematite, um, aluminum oxides, gypsite, for instance. Um, so there, there are a huge amount of secondary minerals that can be formed out of primary minerals, sometimes directly um, through reconfiguration, sometimes uh, the weathering products come into solution and form first very amorphous uh, secondary minerals that slowly crystallize in the soil over long periods of time. Um, that's a good question. Yeah, please ask all these questions when they come up. Um, so I want to uh, discuss that right away um, with, with having feedback from you. Uh, and I had the first question I had, if you look at these kind of amounts of different, um, of different nutrient forms in soil, uh, what, what does that tell you? What, what can you speculate about uh, losses by leaching, for instance? What, what would that tell you? Um, and with an example. Um, and uh, maybe we'll form quickly groups so that you can exchange the ideas among yourselves. And then the group can have um, maybe a, 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 a synthesis or, or a, an example set for, for each of these problems. I'll give you the name group one. So uh, what? give me an example for uh, why you think that um, uh, one nutrient uh, leaches a lot from looking at how much of that nutrient is in which pool. Fine with me. It depends is, a, is probably a very valid characterization. Yes? So I can't do that very fast. Uh, so that's a good reason for saying that something is in, in, in uh, leaching ver very much. Um, group two, why is a nutrient not leaching a lot? And an example for that. Um, phosphorus. phosphorus is not leaching a lot. Why do you think it's not leaching a lot? <coughs> yeah, make it simple for me. Okay, it's not very soluble. Yeah, so P, not much in solution. Uh, so that's probably an indication if you're not, if a nutrient is not a lot in solution, then probably it doesn't leach a lot. And phosphorus is probably a, a uh, uh, safe bet to say that um, it doesn't leach a lot under typical conditions. And we'll, we'll modify and, uh, and, and, and uh, go into detail um, later on for that. Uh, second question. Um, Possibility to improve nutrient availability with organic farming. So if you're doing organic farming, you want to do organic farming, and, and you, you look at this chart and, and um, see what, what nutrients are in which pool, which nutrient would you pick as a target nutrient for, for organic farming? Group three, maybe an idea. Nitrogen. nitrogen is always a good bet, yeah. Nitrogen, you would probably... Uh, look at, at uh, organic farming and say this is a good good nutrient for organic farming. Why do you think so? Um, just to increase the organic matter content. So a lot of nitrogen is in organic matter. That's, and, and so if you increase the organic matter, you probably also increase uh, nitrogen supply. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, what's, what's a candidate, also you guys, what's a candidate that you probably wouldn't target so much with uh, organic farming and increasing uh, 
um, the organic pool. Uh, potassium, for instance, Colin, yeah. Uh, so probably uh, not potassium because it's not um, in, uh, in soil organic matter. Yeah, nutrient analysis. Um, I think I have, have not talked with any of the groups about that issue. So um, uh, well, what's a good, uh, what implications of these different pools, um, what indications do these different pool distributions provide for what you would analyze? The group one, oh, sorry. Uh, was there a hand? Yes. Yeah, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> well, for potassium, you have really high levels, but not necessarily really high levels of um, potassium ions in the solution. Yeah. So you'd, you'd really want to focus on that because that's the plant available. So you want to want to look at the uh, exchangeable or, or plant available form in, in solution. Um, yeah. So uh, so that's probably in in most cases you want to. Um, look at uh, the solution pool of a nutrient. And you mentioned K, sort. <laughs> uh, what are other indications what, what you would look at? Um, well, Tara. When you're asking about nutrient analysis, are you trying to determine plant available, or are you just looking at total nutrient in the source? Um, I'm looking at plant available. What, what would, would plant availability drive? And if, if you look at, at the different nutrient distributions, uh, for potassium, would you look at organic potassium? Probably not. There is nothing. Um, uh, yeah? Yeah, so with potassium, you need to look at the, the soil solution potassium and also look at the amount of labile potassium, which is the, the ability of the soil to, to replace the, the soil solution potassium, which is being uptake. Yeah, you're mentioning already uh, terms um, um, uh, that are will become quite important: so, um, intensity uh, and quantity of of a nutrient. So not only how much is in solution, but also how much is there that can become a solution pool. Uh, and that would be for potassium. That would probably be the exchangeable pool, uh, or maybe even the fixed pool. So you want to have maybe some. Since for potassium, there's a lot of fixed. And what, what is another, fo uh, an, another phosphorus, another nutrient that's a lot of fixed <laughs> phosphorus? OK. Um, uh, th there is also phosphorus. So for phosphorus, is especially, you can, you can see. Uh, wh why would you be interested in, in, in the fixed pool, maybe? Or in, in, the, in the more adsorbed pool, to understand that also? I mean, it's not available, but. But why would you maybe also be interested in that? And for leaching, you already mentioned it. And for nitrogen, group one, we have uh, the other group one, the, the lab group one. We have talked about that in the context of nitrogen um, for, your, for your lab analysis. Which, which pool for phosphorus is, is very low? You mentioned it in the, in the example for uh, leaching already. And that led you to say it's in solution is, is very, very low. So the plant takes up everything that is in solution very rapidly. So what is in solution is it maybe is available, but that cannot alone supply the nutrient with phosphorus. So we need to know something about the unavailable, the not immediately available phosphorus, and probably the replenishment from that pool into the available is an important feature. And, and can you translate that for nitrogen maybe also? Um, like the organic pool yeah. can be very high, but the inorganic pool very low. So it's important to know the mineralization and mobilization ratios and stuff like that. Exactly, Andrew. That's, that's important to realize. Um, that, that for nitrogen, the same story, essentially. There, there, 
the, the nitrogen in the, in the available pool, the, in the soil solution, uh, is taken up very quickly by, um, by the, uh, the plants. But for nitrogen, the most of the nitrogen is in organic form. 90 whatever percent are in organic nitrogen, for, uh, not organic nitrogen. The, the, the plant cannot take that up. So what is really important is the replenishment from the organic pool into the inorganic pool uh, as an estimation of nutrient availability. Um, so these, these, are, these are a few ideas uh, that can come up. And uh, these are just, for the moment, these are just teasers to, uh, to get us going into, into our next questions. Um, if we now take a step further, and, and some of you have taken this step in the discussions already uh, many times. Um, uh, I'm just a lot slower than you guys are. Uh, and uh, that we all know that nitrogen is not just N in the soil solution, but we have nitrate, ammonium, uh, and some nitrite also in the soil solution. Uh, and you can see in the wide ranges here, nitrate can be just 10% or even less of total inorganic nitrogen in the soil solution. It can be 90% or even more. Uh, and for ammonium, the same thing. So we can have almost anything depending on soil conditions, on clim climate conditions. If we're in the tropics, it's very full, warm and nitrification is a lot more rapid than uh, ammonification. Or it can be the other way around uh, if we have waterlogged soils, for instance, there is no oxygen and um, nitrification can't really happen. So we can have almost anything, um, so that doesn't help us much, uh, but uh, so we, it means that we need to uh, really look at that analytically. Sulfur, um, sulfate is what the plants take up and sulfate is what in agricultural soil is practically everything in sulfate. So if we analyze sulfate, we probably know the inorganic sulfur in soils. Uh, H2S is in gas um, that can come out of soils. Um, uh, elemental S can be in soils, uh, is sometimes a fertilizer, uh, so can go by via fertilization into the soil or just geogenic deposits that are in the soil. Um, H2S, where, where do you find H2S uh, evolution sometimes? Some exotic question, huh? Wetlands, Wetlands exactly. So submerged soils, marshes, um, um, uh, coastal areas, um, acid sulfate soils, um, these kind of environments. There you get H H2S uh, losses. Phosphorus, practically only as phosphate, um, hydrogen phosphates, depending on the, on the pH. Uh, calcium, potassium, magnesium as the cation, typically. The uh, micronutrients as, as oxides, hydroxides, or organic complexes, especially for, for copper. That's, that's a, um, an important one that you should keep in mind. So if, if you hear, for instance, if you hear um, uh, bog or fen, and uh, some ecological question about plant communities, the first thing that you think about is uh, copper deficiency. It's probably something copper deficiency plays a role there. So in, in these very organic rich horizons, what you can count on is, is copper deficiency usually. Um, boron molybdenum uh, as a hydroxide or oxide in, in the soil. Uh, then we have an organic part as we discovered earlier and we have uh, frequently stated already that there are these three nutrients that are in organic form. Nitrogen, phosphorus and sulfur are the three nutrients that have a substantial portion uh, or organic pool. Um, and uh, phosphorus to a lesser extent typically than nitrogen or sulfur, but nitrogen and sulfur 95, especially sulfur, 98% of the sulfur is organic. So what is that composed of? And that's where it gets really fishy. Um, nobody ver knows really exactly what this is all about. Um, but there are some numbers around um, that I, I uh, don't recommend to look at very closely, um, but you can look up if you need to. Nitrogen, there are amino sugars in the soil. We don't really know how many uh, amino acids, um, other compounds. Uh, you see it doesn't add up to 100%. We, we don't really know. Uh, these are very, very complex um, 
systems. So we, we have really no idea what that, what that looks like. Um, and uh, there are no analytical tools. We do, we do some extractions. But for instance, we have this, you have, might have heard about it, a, a classic humic acid extraction. So humans and fulvic acid and humic acids and so on. Um, typically, these only extract 20, 30, 40% of the carbon. So and then we do structural analysis of that. So what did we really gain? We, we analyzed 20, 30, 40% of the carbon in the soil and make inferences about that. Um, we have some other wet chemical methods where we extract, but we use acids or strong hy uh, hydrolyzable compounds. They probably change something along the way. And then we're analyzing fragments. We're analyzing a specific amino sugar. We're analyzing a specific phenolic ring with a side chain and make inferences about the large humic mo molecule. So it's, it's really, we are limited. Then there are, then there are um, spectroscopic technique increasingly where we can do solid state analysis. So we shoot on some neutrons or photons on the soil and, and get some uh, spectra out of that. Names like NMR, um, FTIR, and so on uh, come to mind. Um, and and these, these analytical procedures are, are uh, very often very crude and they cannot really pinpoint what, what we have inside. It's very, very complex. Um, we, we know that we have uh, phospholipids in, uh, in, in soil, inositol, phosphorus, and nucleic acids, of course, ATP, ADP. Um, but we know very little what precise um, uh, formation they have in the soil. We used many of those as, as biomarkers um, uh, to make um, conclusions about uh, activity of certain microorganisms, but that's about it. Uh, sulfur mainly... Um, as amino acids, uh, sulfonates, and ester sulfates. And also only there, we have only recent advances to uh, X-ray technology uh, linked to uh, synchrotron radiation that we have a sort of an idea. Uh, up until Brady and Weil, up, up until five years ago, they stated that most of the sulfur, the organic sulfur in soil, is uh, amino acids. Uh, as of two or three years ago, we know that that is not true, that it's probably only 20 or 30 percent. Um, so we continue to, to uh, um, get information about that. <clears throat> um, and uh, this, this chapter is definitely not closed. Uh, and having in mind that this is really, for nitrogen and sulfur, this is the majority of, um, of nitrogen and sulfur in the soil, uh, it warrants research to know more about that because the supply is from the organic pool is the key for uh, sulfur and, and uh, nitrogen supply. Um, I think uh, probably we, we all state always that nitrate is what leaches in soil. We all state that phosphate is what not leaches in soil. And we're always talking about ammonium, nitrate, and phosphate, the inorganic species. But there is also a, or there can be a substantial portion of nitrogen and phosphorus in the soil solution can be organic, not only in total soil, but also in soil solution. And you see here an example for a forest soil for nitrogen and here for phosphorus. And you see here in throughfall, about 50% of the nitrogen in throughfall is organic in this example. And in the O horizons, it's about 90%. So very similar to what is in the, in the solid phase of the soil. We have also in the find in the soil solution. So if we would only analyze nitrate and ammonium in this system, we would grossly underestimate our leaching losses because the majority, vast majority of the nutrient nitrogen losses are organic here. Um, and similar to phos for phosphorus here, also 50%, maybe a little higher, 70, 80% uh, of the losses in this ecosystem are uh, organic losses. And that's very, very important, not only would we miss the vast majority, not quantify it, of these losses? But these have also completely different properties. We already know that, uh, David, you said nitrate has completely different property of, uh, uh, in comparison to, to ammonium for leaching. And, uh, ammonium uh, leaches much less in some soils, not at all, whereas the nitrate typically leaches a lot, um, and, and that varies with soil properties. So, so these species already differ very much, but organic and inorganic differ vastly. Um, so the, the, the leaching of those um, compounds is vastly different. So we need to look at that. And then there are 
then what makes what matters worse, similar to the solid phase, this is not one entity. This is, can be different things. This can be uh, very polar or uh, non-polar. It absorbs, it doesn't absorb, it's so soluble in water, it's not soluble in water. Very, very complicated stories here. Um, and we'll look at that later. Um, I already mentioned that there are some uh, complexes for micronutrients. So zinc and iron um, are very typically in, in complexes, in organic complexes, and this is just an, an example of what that would look like. Um, no, uh, no need to learn that by heart, uh, but it has an important ecological function because uh, it is really a primary uh, mechanism by which nutrients access um, uh, micronutrients because only if they are complex they become soluble and that's not even only a passive mechanism this is something that the uh, plant root actively mediates it exudes what we call exudation uh, it exudes these chelating agents in the rhizosphere so just a millimeter uh, around the, the the root tips and makes these um, uh, micronutrients available and then they go back into the uh, the nutrients. So that, that is an important phenomenon um, and something which we need to uh, look at. This is an example where um, iron concentration is related to iron uptake by a plant uh, for a scenario where we'd have only the iron and then for scenarios where we have these complex builders and you can see that you, sh um, you shoot up the iron concentration and therefore also the iron uptake. So it's an important mechanism for making iron available and that's true for uh, for the other micronutrients as well. Uh, it's not only important for, for the um, uh, nutrient availability, but also for uh, pathogenesis. You see here how soils develop. Um, and uh, uh, here, what soils are these called? This, this is a very characteristic soil of A, which region, and B, what are they called? Uh, why do you think so? The red, the red colors. Yeah, you would, you would, that's deceiving. It could be that these colors would, um, are very typical for an oxisol. Even this more reddish above the, the uh, orangey can be, uh, can be a good indication for an oxisol, but the white above there is typically not. Other ideas? Yeah, Peter. Why do you think? The frost, the white thing? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's uh, snow-covered Ithaca. Um, yes, could be. And, and you're right. There are these, these, uh, these shapes here are something that we call ice kyle. Um, and uh, I think they're still called in the German name. So they, they, are, um, they are frost patterns where, where, um, where water comes in and presses out the the, uh, uh, the soil and then refills with other material very often. That can happen, yeah. It's not. It's not. It could be Ithaca, but um, it's not. It's actually soil. It's not snow. So is that cactus about No. Are they Yes. Like a, a bleach? Yeah. A it's an E horizon, yeah. So yeah, an AE or it's an A horizon, which is always an uh, it's a surface horizon and, and can be also an illuv illuvial, uh, not illuvial horizon, illuvial horizon. Um, so which which region would we find that typically? Which vegetation? Forest. Forests. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Um, this is, this, these are both actually spotter soils, and these are so-called E horizons in, in one of the classifications, or A E horizons. Um, we don't need to bother about that, but uh, these are actually horizons <coughs> where the humic acids um, produced from weakly decomposed litter, uh, from, for instance, especially coniferous forests, um, broken down by fungi because it's very acid, it's cold, probably up here and, and, and further north, boreal forests. 
and uh, these are then organic acids that take out the iron and the aluminum and transport it down. If you do that hundreds and thousands of years, you're, you're left with a very white, white sand. Uh, this is white, white sand. It's the same material. It's not a layered profile. It's the same material. And that leaches down over long periods of time, leaves behind the sand, and then the pH increases in the subsoil. And first, uh, the humic acids stop, um, and then the pH increases more. The iron stops. That's why it's so reddish, a little bit below. And then manganese, actually, which you very often cannot see, um, stops. Um, and... Um, and then you get these beautiful profiles um, that are very, very nice colors very often. But these are very stunning examples of that. So that's, that's another aspect of this chelation and, and, uh, and movement in soil. So it can also lead to pedogenesis. Thank you very much. And we'll see each other in this hall on Thursday morning. Um, so we'll continue with our lecture session on Thursday morning. And I'll post the assignment right away in the next couple of hours. Uh, so you can get working on that. Thanks a lot.